uh, so welcome really everyone to this workshop. It was uh, um, organized within the usage project. And uh, uh, I will start with some introduction from the, uh, about the OGC, uh, which is the institution where I am uh, working on uh, that is uh, uh, in, in charge, the reference organization for the development of the Sensor Things API, and um, uh, is also organizing this workshop together with the DataNex and uh, the Usage uh, Project Consortium. So, yeah. I work for the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium. Uh, the activity within OGC is uh, various, then I will give an overview about it, uh, but especially we are focusing on providing technologies and structures and the tools uh, towards the fair data and fair science, fair technology. Fair means findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, so it's not only open, uh, but it's really about um, providing data information, exchange it in a way that is um, really enabling the, the, the users, the applications that allows us to support all the challenges that are nowadays there, um, such as the Green Deal related the, um, challenges, uh, the climate changes and so on. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, it's a global consortium uh, where there are uh, many uh, members from several sectors and um, uh, we mainly develop standards for supporting such interoperability, such exchange and, uh, um, and the fair science and, uh, um, and tools uh, within the geospatial world. First uh, um, mission of the OGC is about standardization. So we try to provide uh, uh, good standards and usable standards through uh, discussions within the working groups. Uh, we develop the standards and try to identify what are the, the requirements uh, from industry and from users in order to align those with standards. For doing this, we are also using the innovation section uh, of the OGC, where I am actually um, working. I forgot to, to record. Okay, I will start recording from the, from the next, uh, next part, sorry. Um, so where I am currently working, well, no, I start recording now. If uh, anyone has uh, uh, concerns, please let me know. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so uh, um, I was uh, presenting the OGC and uh, I am working in the innovation part of the OGC where um, we are working on projects and doing research, real research. Um, together with uh, uh, other organizations, so we look for uh, interdisciplinary and intersectoral collaborations. Um, we want to, um, to work uh, with our members and uh, to test uh, really what are the standards uh, that are uh, useful, how to develop them further, what, is, what are the new needs and so on. And finally, the third part of OGC is about problem solving and building communities. So within the OGC, we don't have only the uh, standard working group, but also the domain working group within which you can uh, come and uh, exchange about the needs of, uh, um, of the community related applications and challenges. Uh, so we can uh, develop together best practices <laughs> and uh, uh, how really to use standards for the, the good use and advantage of everyone. Uh, these are the three uh, styles of OGC, and uh, uh, something that will come will also be something about education and training. So the OGC Academy is about to be designed and developed, so you will hear about it soon. Um, talking of this, so uh, this workshop fits within uh, two of the three uh, parts of OGC. So first uh, is about innovation because we are participating uh, for uh, as, a, as an innovation program within usage. Uh, Oscar probably will 
tell about it later uh, more thoroughly, but um, uh, it's a three-year project. It's an Horizon project funded about the, the, the data spaces for Green Deal. So uh, it has started uh, last summer, 2022, and it will last for three years until 2025. The goal of usage is about enabling data search, data access, data processing, and uh, making a, a prototype of a data space uh, that's, that can support Green Deal-related applications and use cases. You can have all the information uh, in our website. And uh, about the standardization uh, role of OGC, uh, we are uh, developing the sensor things uh, within OGC, the sensor things um, API and uh, uh, schemas are, uh, are developed. So these are uh, um, intended as um, as supporting uh, as a support for interoperability about the Internet of Things devices and uh, uh, and applications over the web. Okay, so uh, I am already uh, uh, with uh, a bit late. Uh, so thank you, and uh, I will give the word to. Marco Minghini from JRC um, that will introduce us sensor things in Inspire. Marco, I can I will allow you to share the screen. Thank you, thank you, Francesca. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's share my. I cannot find you. Yeah, here. Okay, thank you, Marco. Please go ahead. Okay, let me share the screen. Maybe get rid of. Okay. Do you see the full screen now? Yes, we do. Okay. So good morning, everyone. First of all, thanks a lot uh, to the Usage uh, Project Consortium, to Francesca, to uh, Pier Giorgio in particular for uh, the invite and for the opportunity uh, to participate in this workshop uh, um, about Sensor Things API. I uh, work at the JRC in the team responsible for the technical coordination of the uh, Inspire directive. So we take care of uh, operating, maintaining, and also modernizing the Inspire infrastructure in strict coordination with the policy master of Inspire, that is the director general for um, environment. In this presentation, I will basically show you what we did with Sensor Things API and how we included it in the Inspire uh, technical framework uh, um, as a good practice. So let me start from here. Um, this is a report that we published at the end of 2021, so still quite recent and relevant. It's a science for policy report. That means it's not really for technical people. It's also for technical people, but it's also for policy uh, makers, uh, project managers, and everyone uh, with an understanding uh, of geospatial uh, data sharing in general. And it's a report where we uh, provide our vision uh, for the future and how we want to modernize Inspire and how the future of Inspire and of uh, special data infrastructure should be. Uh, we do that uh, by, first of all, reflecting on what has happened in Inspire uh, in the first 15 years of implementation. You know that Inspire entered into force in 2007. Of course, we learned a lot since then. We Many things worked well, many things didn't work so well. So we really take stock of the situation. And then, first, we assess the new political context that is around the twin uh, digital and green transition that is exactly what the usage project in a way is addressing so the european green deal data space and the policy context in europe but also the technological context which is totally different from what we had 15 years ago and based on this and based on the lessons learned we close the report by developing our own vision for uh, the future of again inspire and sdis and also we try to um, list a number of concrete actions on how we can achieve it. In a nutshell, um, this is the vision. So these are some conclusions from the report. Data sharing and uh, we could also say interoperability is not a goal in itself, 
but they are a means to an end. And the final uh, goal uh, should always be to take better decisions to innovate uh, society. And we say that to be sustainable, uh, to remain sustainable in the long term, but also to remain fit for purpose uh, to the current uh, policy agenda, Inspire should more and more blend in with the broader IT ecosystem that exists and that is composed of spatial and non-spatial data, but also policies, infrastructures, uh, institutions, technologies, and so on. Um, only in this way, uh, Inspire could really um, attract a broader uh, community of stakeholders and uh, address an increasing number of use cases. Um, Inspire could, in a way, um, um, enable its entry level also to non-geospatial people. Um, that could happen only with some ingredients, for example, making uh, the INSPIRE governance a more flexible um, and more agile, uh, but also by facilitating technical approaches for using or for sharing the data and adopting uh, standards and technologies that are proven uh, to work in practice. As I said, there are also some actions that we listed in, in the report. You can, of course, uh, have a look at the report and uh, um, uh, read all the details here. I just want to focus on some of them uh, that are relevant to the presentation and to the role of OGC uh, Sensor Things API. From the organizational or governance uh, point of view, we would like to have uh, um, a governance in Inspire that is not uh, really top-down, that is not uh, uh, bottom-up, but that is really distributed across multiple levels, um, that is co-designed. Uh, it's an ecosystem uh, approach. So uh, we don't want only the data providers that uh, have been uh, the almost uh, only uh, actors involved in the Inspire governance so far, but we would like to have more actors that together interact and generate value, and they co-design really solutions. From the more technological point of view, um, we would like to ensure always the technological neutrality, avoiding vendor lock-in, of course, but also embracing uh, standards and technologies that are already adopted and already shown to work in practice and to bring benefits. Avoid custom extensions uh, of standards so that uh, um, INSPIRE requirements can be satisfied by um, out-of-the-box solutions without extensions. And finally, embrace well-documented and standard-based APIs. Of course, OGC Sensor Things API is one of these. So this leads to the concept of INSPIRE good practices that we have introduced exactly with the purpose to modernize the infrastructure. It's not just a uh, a matter of substituting old technology and standards with new technology and standards, it's, it's a bit more. We would like to uh, adopt new technologies and approaches that add value to the infrastructure, that uh, um, generate some benefits, uh, that simplify the life of the users of the data and the providers of the data. What are good practices, actually? These are uh, anything ranging from new technologies or standards or, in general, approaches uh, for data sharing and or for data um, encoding. Um, they uh, typically derive from the experience gained from 15 years of implementation. For example, in Inspire, we used to have the um, thematic clusters uh, platform. This was a, a forum with uh, domain-specific discussions and a lot of lessons learned and a lot of feedback, a lot of good practices in the Inspire implementation emerged from that uh, forum. Um, in the screenshot, you have uh, an idea of what are currently the Inspire good practices. Some are candidates, some are endorsed. I will explain uh, later what is the difference, but you can see good practices around data encoding. You can see, for example, GeoPackage on the left. You can see um, SDMX uh, on, the, on the right, for example. Good practices around data sharing, also OGC Sensor Things API, but also, for example, OGC API features, and um, a lot more. Now, who can uh, actually, who should propose a good practice, who should endorse, uh, who should create it? Uh, uh, this is a very important point. Uh, it's not the GRC, it's not the Commission that uh, um, puts the focus on one technology or another and uh, um, defines and takes care of uh, introducing something or changing the Inspire technical framework. It's the community, it's the, uh, the stakeholders. Uh, so we would like good practices to be community-driven and community-initiated um, initiatives. And we do that by using collaborative platforms, in particular GitHub that we are using now for the whole Inspire infrastructure, from our help desks to our good, practice, uh, good practices to our discussion forums uh, and so on. 
how to uh, actually submit and propose and have a new good practice in Inspire. There is a stepwise procedure. The link below points you to the page where this is described in detail. But basically, there are six uh, steps. Initially, there is an initiation. So the group of people who would like to propose a good practice, typically the group of people who are familiar with the new technology, have to um, feel a kind of a good practice speech that explains what the good practice is about, what benefits it brings, uh, to um, to inspire. Then there is the first step of the submission as a good practice candidate to the MIGT. The MIGT is the technical subgroup of the maintenance and implementation group that is the main governance body in Inspire that is formed by representatives of the member states. If the good practice is endorsed as a candidate good practice, then there is an outreach phase. That's very important because this consists in a webinar, typically where the good practice, again, is explained to the community, uh, advantages and disadvantages are described, and uh, um, evidence of implementation, existing implementation, is also provided. So that's a very key factor. We don't want simply to embrace a new standard or a new technology, but we would like to also see how this works in practice. So evidence of implementation, evidence of benefits is uh, crucial. After that, um, the, sub, the, the good practice can be submitted to the MIG, clearly taking into account possible comments from the MIGD and or from the community. After the outreach phase, the MIG endorses officially the good practice. Then there are two uh, additional steps. The first is the legal scrutiny. That's very important because, you know, Inspire um, has a very uh, wide and comprehensive legal framework, the directive, but also a lot of implementing rules. So we need to be sure that... Uh, um, the, 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 the specifications of the good practice do not break, do not conflict with uh, any um, legal requirement under this uh, complex legal framework. So this is just a quick um, legal scrutiny typically done by uh, DGM, the Director General for the Environment. And finally, there's the feedback. That's very important. Feedback is, in a way, a continuous step that doesn't uh, end. Um, it means keeping the good practice alive, uh, keeping the repository alive, um, providing continuously feedback on the implementation, provide evidence where the good practice is used, and of course, solving possible issues, um, new use cases, and so on. Now, moving to uh, OGC Sensor Things API, um, the good practice proposes it as a new inspired download uh, service. Clearly, um, this is an alternative to, uh, in general, OGC sensor observation services um, and allows to serve uh, dynamic data from uh, sensors. OGC sensor observation services uh, is already clearly an, uh, an inspired download uh, service. The idea of the good practice is to propose an alternative, not uh, a replacement. Um, the benefit, of course, is uh, the much, much easier way to share data, the possibility to perform complex queries, and so on. So I don't spend uh, time here uh, explaining the standard. Uh, it is aligned, of course, to the W3C data on the web best practices. Uh, more in detail on what the good practice is about, it basically deals both with the data encoding aspect and the uh, data sharing aspect. From the encoding uh, side, uh, the data model of Sensor Things API that Francesca has quickly showed before in a slide is or was proven to be aligned with the requirements from the uh, environmental monitoring facilities, uh, data team in Inspire. Um, and to the observation model that is used in Inspire that uh, derives from the Inspire generic conceptual model and in turn from the OGC uh, observations and measurements. So there is a mapping. I mean, the, the, the mapping works. Uh, there is an alignment. So uh, nothing really, ex, uh, let's say, uh, extra to do. Uh, the same is for data sharing, because the uh, REST-based uh, uh, approach used by uh, Sensor Things API that is modeled on the open data protocol standards is also aligned with the uh, INSPIRE requirements taken from the implementing rules on network services. So this is in a nutshell what you should do to propose an INSPIRE sensor and an INSPIRE good practice. So you need to make sure that what you propose is in line with the INSPIRE uh, legal and, uh, in a way, technical uh, requirements. And this is exactly what goes on for OGC Sensor Things API. Uh, some content around uh, uh, the good practice on the left, that you have the full page or actually an extract of the full page of the good practice. Um, there's the link there. You have all the links, so you can just... Uh, um, check everything in detail, but this is where the good practice is explained, the benefits are explained, uh, there are also links to existing uh, implementations. Um, on the right, you have the um, GitHub repository, or 
again, an extract of the reading of the, of the repository. Here you can find all the content and all the links, again, to uh, implementations and to the technical uh, details. Um, in the middle of the slide, there's a paper that uh, somehow um, was instrumental to the submission of the good practice. This was from 2018 and was uh, co-authored by uh, several people that are also here in the workshop, uh, Isikati here, Steve, uh, uh, Hilke, uh, Sylvain, and, and others, so, so my colleagues Alexander and Michael. And this, in a way, uh, was anticipating the good practice because it was, I think, the first uh, tentative uh, to uh, see whether uh, Sensor Things API could be aligned with uh, the requirements of uh, Inspire. Um, now, I will spend just uh, um, uh, one minute to, to explain the API for Inspired Project. This will be presented later from Cathy, uh, as I see from the agenda, but I think it's quite important here to mention because this was also instrumental uh, to the good practice. Um, it's a study uh, funded under the ELISE action of the ISA Square uh, funding program of the Commission that we launched uh, some three, four years ago. The objective of the study was uh, to evaluate the feasibility, the advantages, disadvantages, um, the implications of using new uh, API-based standards, in particular uh, Sensor Things API for dynamic data and uh, OGC API features for static data uh, to serve geospatial data within Inspire, thinking on the investments already made by uh, member states to implement Inspire. So how can we move from, in a way, uh, the legacy infrastructure to uh, a modernized uh, framework? And we explicitly required uh, to address different use cases on a cross-border uh, level and, if possible, in multiple domains. Um, the work was very well done, a lot of good results. Here you can see some of them on the left, the technical report that is publicly available, and um, on the right, there's a, a website that is uh, basically synchronized with the repository that uh, Cathy is, is maintaining and provides all the results uh, on the project. Again, uh, links to the implementations. Uh, um, there is also a part explaining the standard. And also in the middle of the slide, you can see basically a link to um, a, a workshop or a webinar that was uh, done within the ELISA a series of webinars and that corresponds to the outreach phase or step that I described before. So this was exactly uh, the moment where the good practice was explained to the community, was described. Again, there was an initial uh, session on um, um, description of the standard that I would really suggest to all the newcomers in a way. And this was followed by uh, an explanation of why this is useful in Inspire, the mapping, and so on. The final slide is about the next steps uh, on our uh, side uh, um, in order to follow up with the good practice and in a way to complement its, uh, uh, its adoption within Inspire, we will uh, add support for it. First, in the Inspire Geo Portal. Uh, Inspire Geo Portal is the point of access to all data shared by member states under Inspire. But also in the Inspire Reference Validator, which is the tool we use, the reference uh, tool that uh, member states and everyone uses to check compliance of resources, data, metadata, and also services with Inspire requirements. Also, uh, a very interesting initiative that is currently ongoing is, the, is another good practice, and this is on uh, JSON or GeoJSON um, encoding for the data. That's important, of course, for Sensor Things API, where JSON is the default uh, encoding. So feel totally free to intervene and to uh, contribute to this activity that is currently uh, really happening right now. Final point is really something for, for you as a, as a consortium, um, as a project. Um, as I said before, the good practice uh, ends, the good practice process ends with a feedback um, step. Feedback really means keeping the repository alive, um, showcasing implementation. So please tell us where uh, the good practice, where the standard is used in practice uh, to serve uh, inspired data and also provide feedback on the implementation. Uh, does it work? Are there issues? Um, anything to discuss, uh, and so on. So this is very important, and we really count on, on you, uh, uh, given the important and the central role of, of the standard in the, in the project. So that is it, and thanks a lot uh, again. Thank you very much, Marco. We'll for sure take uh, your invitation to provide feedback and collaborate together with that. Thank you for it. Um, I, we can uh, uh, maybe you can ask questions to Marco later after the uh, the the other presentation. So we 
have the the overall overview of the uh, of the implementations. Uh, so here is now how to proceed. <coughs> yeah, sorry, today is really it's really hard. Um, yeah, here today. Here is the. Well, let's do it like this. This is the rest of the program for today. So after this uh, uh, interesting introduction from uh, Marco at the JRC and Sensor Things in Inspire, we'll have a round of uh, presentations and overview about uh, the available implementations and uh, also success stories because it's also about how the, um, these implementations are used in some concrete cases. Uh, and uh, after some uh, question and answer session and the break, uh, we'll have instead uh, a round table uh, with some invited participants from Italian authorities and uh, public administrations uh, about with, we, within which uh, we can discuss a bit more how to bring these, uh, um, these technologies into practice. And uh, we'll uh, uh, finish with some uh, uh, presentations about the EU projects uh, that are planning to use and develop further sensor things. So now the... <coughs> These are the next speakers for the next session. Uh, Steve Liang, unfortunately, cannot present uh, uh, live, but has sent a, a video about uh, um, his developments. Then uh, we'll have BRGM France uh, with uh, Sylvain Grelet and Michael uh, Michael uh, Bofield. Fraunhofer Institute with Hilke van der Schaaf, Dataco, Katish Light, and uh, the next uh, with Luca Giovannini. So I launched the video, please. Give me any feedback in case you are you are not able to listen or see it. Okay, nobody is able to do anything at the moment, I think. So I open it again. Why am I not hearing anything? Wait. Eh, ma non, non, ha, non c'è il video, non c'è l'audio. Okay, so um, hoping that we can proceed to the following presentation and then we try to um, to fix the issues. Sylvain, I think it's your turn. I allow you to uh, to present. Yes, good. But from my side, we've been discussing the background. We'd agree that my talk would be oh, okay. the first one because I explain the logic of the model. And then Sivir can continue with the details what he's done with it. It works. Is it okay to reinstate the, the, the original order? I think that would help everybody. Give me one moment and my presentation will be ready. Yeah, I think it made more sense. It will give a more context, technical context, what we're presenting afterwards. Yeah, I... Can, can, can you give me a presentation, right? Is it working? Um, I can't present yet. You have to make me presenter, please.
No, non va più. In pausa. In pausa. No. No, no, non mi fa male. Then. You may be present right now, but are you well? It seems the only uh, organizer yeah. is having technical difficulties and cannot make it. Who is the organizer? Yeah, indeed. Who is the organizer account of the webconf? Because we're having a red banner on the top of our screen saying that organizer meeting technical difficulties and the session might end soon if the organizer, organizer then does not join back. Is that Marco Falconi and the organizer? No, it's me, but um, yeah. it's Francesca Nardo, but go to meeting has quit, so I'm not sure who is now the organizer. I, I'm reopening it. Oh, the organizer is back with the, the red banner. Oh, yeah, we it. see you twice. That's stereo mode, keep that. <laughs> Okay. Could it be that now with Francesca oh, account you can design presenters now? Okay. Oh, wait, we have uh, Kathy, please, please go ahead and uh, yeah. Okay. Why, why, why am I on this slide? Sorry. Take okay. out. Um, Sorry for the confusion. I'm Kathy Schleid from Data Cove, and I'll be bringing you some information what we've been doing, what we did in the API for Inspire project, and specifically more, more details on the Sensor Things API. Sorry for being a bit geeky, but it's to give you a basic overview of how does the Sensor Things API actually work. If you want all the details, look at Marco's presentation. He's provided you all of the, the recordings of the various training sessions we've done. So, API for Inspire, this is a project, as Marco already mentioned, we evaluated both the OGC API features and OGC API sensor things for use within the Inspire context. Both of these resulted in Inspire good practices, so now both, both of these APIs are good to go within Inspire. At the bottom of the page, you've got the link to the API for Inspire web page. There's any, basically anything you never wanted to know about sensor things is there. We've tried to do a totally complete tutorial. So anything you'd like to understand better, check it out there. And also, as Marco mentioned, all of this work was funded by the Elise project as a way of moving Inspire into the future. OGC Sensor Things API has been an OGC standard since 2016. And the version 1.1, which is essential for working within Inspire, was approved 2020. Once we got that finalized, it was no problem finalizing the good practice. The, it's got a very nice, simple core data model really embedded in the API. That's a major difference to the normal OGC APIs, which just say provide features, provide tiles, provide records. Here we have a basic core structure, and that's based on the OGC observations and measurements model. And this is one reason it was so easy to transfer the Inspire data models to sensor things because the Inspire data models dealing with dynamic data, they're all using the observations and measurements. Since sensor things uses the same structure, it was very easy to just do the mapping and everything ran. The further bit about it is it's a wonderfully powerful API due to the OData protocol. So it allows some really cool queries. I'll give you some simple examples in a few slides later. And what's really nice is, I mean, it's called sensor things but it can be used to provide basically any type of observational or measurement data on anything. Uh, so you really don't need a sensor. And I mean, with an API for Inspire, especially since that project, the moment we started, 
COVID showed up on the scene and we had no events and lockdown and we had to be creative and we started thinking out of the box, what, what can we provide? And a nice series of things I won't be presenting here, but it's all available from the site is we, we've gotten information on air quality and, and COVID, strong links there. We knew all of the European air quality data is, is available via Inspire Structures. We had two long nights and managed to transmogrify the data to sensor things, had that online. But that really just started getting us going because then we had the air quality. Then we, we had the idea, wait, there's all this information on COVID, how many cases, how many vaccinations. That's also just an observation on the thing. So we set up a second endpoint, all available via API for Inspire, providing number of COVID cases. This got us to a really creative point because then we realized the number of cases isn't relevant if you don't know the population of the region. And so we put up a further endpoint, taking the, the demography records from Eurostat. And again, we could nicely align these with the spatial units and nuts regions provided via sensor things, and it's there, it's available, go to API for Inspire, and you can see just how far out of the box you can play with sensor things. But now going into the details. Here we've got the sensor things data model, which has already been shown, and I'd like to walk you through what do these individual boxes mean. So the, the core thing with sensor things is the thing. This is some real world object where you have your sensor. It can be your monitoring station. It can be the room where you've got your thermometer. And, and sometimes we actually use this to also play with what we are observing on. But this is always one of the essential real world objects in your setup. It's usually the thing you have your sensor mounted on. But again, you don't need a sensor. All things have a location or could also have multiple locations. And thing locations can also change over time. So, I mean, the, the, the direct location provided here is this thing is exactly here. However, a thing can have multiple locations. I could do one location which has a nice geo-adjacent object. I can do a second location which provides a description of the address. I can provide a third location which, let's say, has a wicked encoding of the location. And if my thing starts moving, I mean, this can be something mounted on the ground, but this could be a drone. If the drone moves, it is constantly somewhere else. In order to keep track of where it was, we've got this historical location type and all locations which are no longer applicable are still retained via the historical location link. And therefore, you know, where's your thing now and where has your thing been over time? Okay, so now we've got the thing and where it is. Now going on to the data stream. This is what pulls together what type of information are we measuring from that thing. So this groups together the various other bits we see here. I'll describe them more in more detail later, but it basically, it says this thing is linked to that sensor, which is measuring the following observed property. The observed property could be the concentration of ozone. It could be the number of COVID cases. It could be the water level. It could be the temperature. That's the nice thing about this model is you add a new observed property and you can provide data on new concepts. And when you've got all of that strung together, you then provide the observations provided by that sensor for that observed property linked to this data stream. And now we're going into the details I've already mentioned a little bit. The sensor is the device which is actually providing the values. This could be some electronic sensor. This could also be a person reporting data. We've used this for biodiversity data. This can be the grad students you send down into the field. This can be some numbers coming from somewhere. So, I mean, when we were doing the COVID case data, our sensor where the national repository is providing current data. Observed property is what is actually being provided in the measurement. So, as mentioned, this could be temperature, this could be a water level, any, any type of fact that you are determining on your object, it's your observed property. Then we've got the observation. This is really the, the core payload. This is where we provide one individual met value pertaining to the sensor and observed property and thing described in the data stream. So if we have a time series, we start collecting lots of these individual observation types and attaching them to the data stream. 
One short note here, we also we have three different times. This often confuses people. We've got the phenomenon time. That's when the thing we measured actually happened. So the phenomenon time is just about always provided. The result time is for the case where you're doing some sort of an, a later analysis. You take a sample, you send it to the lab. The sample was taken today. You don't get the result until tomorrow. Once you've got the result, you add the result time. Valid time is the third time we have here. And for, for normal measurements, this is rarely used. It's used in some cases where you say, I've taken a measurement and I say this value this counts for the next hour. However, where valid time becomes really valuable is when you're doing various modeling and estimation. And that's a further potential usage of the sensor things API. You can provide information, not just things that a sensor has measured in the past, you could replace the sensor with a model and have your sensor model something for the future and provide forecasts. If you're providing a forecast, you need to provide information for what time period is this valid. Tomorrow the weather will be sunny, then the valid time is tomorrow. And finally, going through this diagram, we've got the feature of interest. These are then the actual real world objects this is being monitored. So, I mean, if I have water quality, I could have here, I could have my environmental monitoring facility. I have my sensor attached. It's measuring water temperature. I have my values. Here I've got my little sample or my sampling point. So this is then the explicit object I'm measuring on. Now going into details of the API. So there, there's a, a demo link at the bottom. I'll be making these slides available. And if you hit that link, you are basically here at the basic API overview. It's always the base URI plus the version you're going at. That gives you an overview of all data which is available. So you've got a list of all the different classes provided, can click your way there. If you click into an individual class, here we've got the example for things. So if you click on a link on one of the, the links at things, you get a list of all the things that are available in that system. If you want to access an individual thing, if you know the identifier of it, you add the ID in round brackets at the end, and then you get exactly that thing returned. So this is the basic way of how do you access things at the API. It's, it's different than OGC API because it's based on OData, not Open API, but it has all the same functionality and way much more. So this is the basic way of, of accessing it. Now going into how can we tailor our requests, our responses actually. The first four I'm presenting here are basic housekeeping. So top, tell, you can specify how many objects you want returned. Default sending, setting tends to be 100. You, you do a request, you get the first 100 things. If you want more things, you then need the second request, skip. The skip you can use for paging and say, okay, I have top. I've got 100 request, um, values back. I can now do a second request saying skip 100, then I get the next 100. However, I can also change the value in top. I can say, um, I, I, I can't cope with much data, just give it to me in blocks of 10. Then you can go through in small chunks. You can then set, set skip to 10, go through that that way. You can also go the other direction. You can say, I, I, I can cope with the data. Give me, give me 1,000 at a time. I will go through that. Related again to this is also the, the count parameter. There, there you can request that you get the, the total number of features. So this, this can help you page through it. And this is usually, usually set to fall, false by default because it, it is a bit processing intensive. So the, the system is faster if it doesn't with each request have to provide you how many it really does. If you want to know, ask, you can get it. Final housekeeping option is order by. There you can point to a specific attribute. You can say, give me all observations ordered by the phenomenon time descending, and then you've got the newest observations at the top. So the, these are basic housekeeping things. How do I page through the stuff? How do I access certain bits? Now we go to some of the really cool bits on the tabling responses. The first one is the select. And this allows you to clearly specify which attributes of the classes do you actually want? So, I mean, if, if you do the normal default request, you get all attributes we have for that class. However, that's often overkill. So here's a simple example of one, one of the thing, things from the air things is one of the German measurement stations. 
if you don't need all of this, let's say you just want the name and the description, that's good enough for what you're doing right now, you can use the select uh, request and say, okay, I want this thing, but please just give me the name and the description. And then you get a nice tight little piece of JSON just providing those concepts. So this lets you really access the service, but not just take what is there. You can really tailor it. I just need these little bits. And this way you've got really lightweight data payloads. Second one of these really nice tailoring bits is the filter. The one bit which is confusing, filter in sensor things, is what select would be under SQL. This is where I'm constantly confusing myself. This is how you can create various filters saying, I want, give me all values where this attribute has a specific value. So go, going to this, this example, we've, again, we've got the same German station. If I access the endpoint normally, it's the first station that pops up. Let's say I, I want to see the Austrian stations. I live in Vienna. I want to see the local stuff. So if I want to do that, we, we've, got the, we've got the country code within our data, so we can filter by the data. And so again, we've got our endpoint. I now haven't specified which object because I don't know which objects are in Austria. But I say filter it on all, all, all things where the property's country code equals AT. And the first one that's, that pops up is one of the stations here in Vienna. So that way you can really nicely filter and say which bits do you want, which features you want returned. Finally, the expand. This is one of the mega cool ones I've yet to see in other APIs. And this lets you really lump the data together as you like it. If you think back to the data model, you've got these eight different classes linked together. You could view that as a, a graph. And you can say you start at one class and you go along this model graph and come to the neighboring type, say, I actually want to provide that also. And I, I, I want to inhale that. I, I want to take that in my belly. So with, ex with ex expand, you can start with one type and say, actually, give me the second type nested in. So again, starting with a simple thing, I then expanded it to say, I have my thing. I only have the name and the description. I do that by the select as shown earlier. However, I want to see what data streams are attached. So here I see we've got this data stream attached to this measurement station, and I see they're measuring NO2. So that's the data stream I could then use to go and go to the observation and then get all of the NO2 measurements at this station. And that's it. Now you get to see the really fun things that have been done with this. Thank you very much, Cathy. Now let's try again uh, with the Steve uh, um, with the Steve video, and uh, if it doesn't work, okay, we'll skip it. So present, include, major sounds, share. Calgary, Calgary. Um, I've been involved in changing uh, sensor mapping element no, 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 in particular no, 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 no. for a long time. Um, and I'm the chair of uh, OGC Sensor Mapping Network. And I want to share with you and I want to share with you exactly my journey and what we are doing at Sensor Up, but also yeah, how to build a sensor web solution for positive global impact. Okay, um, a little bit about the company. Uh, the story is this, I'm a professor involved in the standard making and at the very, very beginning, like, you know, on the, on the, on the right hand side, you can see actually I took this picture um, uh, back in 2004 and we worked together uh, in a small ring in, in a small ring near Washington DC and then how to build standards and to enable a sensor web. So it's where he started uh, uh, back then. And, uh, you know, we, we give us some, uh, the standards, different versions, and then I implemented uh, all the versions. Um, so learned a lot of lessons. And then I was like, okay, how can we share the lesson and to have a real impact, right? So I was like, 
start a company. So let's have a start a company to show, okay, my thesis, okay, my concept, what can be done to show that. So we started sensor, uh, sensor up, and then we started 2011, but you know, uh, didn't have much going on. But 2014, we have our first customer, and then start to you know to build technology and build a team. Right now, we have about 30 people. We are funded by venture capital, so we're ready to run the financing. Hopefully, we'll close another round this year. And then uh, our mission is really building a sensor web, make its information accessible and useful, and for positive global impact. And hopefully today I can share, share some use cases and our thesis about this. So sensor things, or you know, sensor web enablement, right? It, it's, it's a core, but just the start. It's not just the end, right? So we're like, okay, how can we build an ecosystem, a tool chain, to use the sensor web information and to uh, build solutions, right? And so we have a product called Mission Control. It's a desktop user experience, right? And then we, we didn't call it a dashboard or viewer. It's a mission control. And not just about data. It's like, after you have data from sensors, so what? After you have dots on the map in real time, so what? We believe actually it's important to have a solution to trigger operational execution in the field. So you can have a loop data prediction from the models and to get operational execution to get things done and the sensor to validate the action has happened, right? So we call it mission control. It connects everything, everyone in real time. It can enable someone in front of the desktop to work with the sensors and work with people on uh, the boots on the ground. And one key component is, again, to answer so what question is like data, so what, right? We have a no code, low code uh, workflow engine. So drag and drop and allow users to really, okay, data comes in and so what, right? When the person enter in a, in a geofence and notify somebody, and then when a rail car enter a geofence, like a rail yard, and we dwell for more than, for example, 24 hours, right? Send notifications, so, so on and so forth, right? So it's really about answer the so what question. And such workflow, we believe, is a core component to stitch different information and actions in the sensor web together. And from a desktop user experience, right? So how can the user in front of the screen and work with the field? So we developed this as a empower human as a sensor and actuator, right? So it's outpost to protect user, but also, also get things done. So offer a digital field experience for workers. And for example, you have uh, you know a firefighter, for example, can use outpost, right, and to detect the you know the fatigue and stress and the heart rate. And oh, by the way, with uh, outpost, we have both Android and uh, and iPhone, and as well as the um, uh, <laughs> Apple Watch and the Samsung Watch solution. It's really enable the field execution, the field ex execution, right, from the sensor to the um, predictions and to human have a judgment and work with the field workers to get things done. We believe it's a very uh, critical component for such sensor web. Again, the question is like, so what? What's next to get things done? Okay, um, short video to show you what uh, how we're doing. Question I always in my mind is, what are the pressing challenges or problems that human race we are facing? It must use a sensor web as the solution. 
That's a good question. Right? I think so. <laughs> and then, so that's a good question. So this is the question I want to, a message I want to leave, um, you know, here and to you know share with you that um, what problems we are facing today, you must use a sensor web as the solution. For example, we found one, methane emissions reduction. You must use multiple sensors from different systems and work together and then to basically uh, detect and then so that we can dispatch people to repair them and then to get things done. And the sensor comes back to validate it, right? It's been repaired. So methane emissions require satellites, drones, airplanes, towers, vehicles, and people, uh, boots on the ground. <laughs> and so actually right now sensor up is really much focusing on building a sensor web to reduce methane emissions from sensors to predictions to modeling and boots on the ground, get things done. And sensor to detect again and have the loop like this, right? Okay, so if you forget everything you see today, I just want to leave this message to you. Okay, what are the problems that we must use a sensor web to solve so that we can have a positive global impact? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> and uh, now, Sylvain. Okay, I made you presenter, Sylvain. I think you can uh, you can share your screen. Uh, some I start the recording again because it had stopped when I crashed. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you confirm you see my screen properly? Yes, perfect. Thank you. And the good one, I suppose, I guess, uh, the slideshow. Okay. So uh, I was told to give you a feedback on sensor things implementation. The title uh, in the schedule I mentioned water, but um, after discussion uh, with Fernanda, an organizer of the of the workshop, I'm, I'm going to give you a um, feedback on the dynamics regarding for sensor things in France because we're having important dynamic there. Um, that's also a journey somehow. I, I'm reporting a bit like what Steve was uh, was just doing right uh, right before. Uh, we started to prototype a uh, sensor things API in 2017, 2018 on a, the French uh, ground order level monitoring system after having um, discussed, contributed to the, the spec at some point. And progressively, uh, this started to accelerate and have more and more uh, impact and parties interested in that. We moved to, and, and again, we do last in examples afterwards, but so that you actually remember that's an important dynamics in journey. We moved to uh, the year afterward, um, prototyping and actually pushing close to production, uh, sensing the API deployment in the French water quality database and uh, some on top of some web services for the National River Gauge System. And we gain progressively more interest from the French uh, National Institute for Ocean Science, that's IFREMER, and the French Agronomic Institute, and then even more growing interest from various French research infrastructures, one on the critical zone, that's in the phase between soil, groundwater, and atmosphere. Uh, the that Terra is, uh, is a French research infrastructure on uh, solid earth environment and stuff. Plus others, I've just discovered uh, Juan pasting in the chat example from colleagues at CIRAD as well, south of France. And at the end of the day, we, we had uh, an important national research data workshop dedicated to sensor things API, and I will reuse uh, and grab slides from this workshop. And we and also then, uh, we also, let, that one is a bit extra for our friends, but broadening the domain implementations uh, through the LGC groups, and I will give you feedback on the geotech and what quality interoperability experiments we're running, and in which we actually do have sensor things API at the backbone. And of course, all through that uh, journey, uh, always supporting funding evolution in open source communities implementation of sensor things, because that's the topic of today. So uh, first is back uh, on the National Groundwater Monitoring System. So the, the system is the following. We have piezometers monitoring aquifers and acquiring raw groundwater levels. Um, what basically the, is mapped our national system to, the, to observation and measurements because of the semantic backbone and then to sensor things API. And we use sensor things API actually to acquire in that context and re-expose uh, readings from field sensors. So how is it going? We have field sensors that push uh, every hour uh, readings 
sweet PRS technology. And this come from, yeah, vendor. At that stage, vendors still push their uh, own semantics, but we mapped up to uh, the relevant semantics. Then at the end of the day, we feed uh, Frost implementation of SensorSync's API standard. We use actually uh, SensorSync's API to the, um, I would say to the fullest in that sense, because we use it as a true RESTful API, but we also use this uh, MQTT of mechanism to, in, uh, to insert observation, and that's, that's really powerful. That's a game changer. That specification is a game changer since Western's API. With regard to what we were using uh, within um, the sensor observation service specification, we used to have SOS here, and we definitely moved to sensor things API for a national system. Beauty of interoperability, of course, is, yeah, just for the sake of those workshops, I just grabbed the one uh, endpoint and a uh, data stream, and just a matter of declaring the endpoint in various sensor things API clients who actually do have access to the same content, which is maybe not zoom to the same time window, but actually that's exact same sensor, same values and stuff. And even in some clients that are really overly Atlantic, like the Internet of US clients. This one is the Fronog for Web Genesis. This one is actually the client developed for the Marine Agency in France, so that's not tailored to our specific need, but it works. That's interoperable. And the QGIS plugin as well. Uh, then, this deployment is on top of the French uh, water quality database, which uh, that use case is really interesting because it allows to test um, sensor things API spec and its first implementation on top of big volume of observation. Here we have uh, 130 million and more now observation uh, in that database. So again, domain model mapped to the generic, I would say meta model of uh, 1M sensor things API, which result uh, to contribution to the, um, as a result to the contribution to the API in, for Inspire project that was already mentioned. So this is just to avoid too much technicalities. That's what domain colleagues can access in a, in a client. So we have next to the others that has flowed uh, French and German side of the Rhine River. And that allows to plot station and water quality station here uh, from various information systems monitoring the same um, real-world object here that's the Rhine. Something that was not done, but that's not a, the purpose of sensor things API, is actually mapping cod lists. That's the obvious next steps. But here you have calcium here, you have calcium there, and that allows to plot data coming from two different information systems, monitoring the same real-world object. So that's the, the purpose of our job, right? Allowing our domain colleagues to do their, their work uh, instead of exchanging CSV file over over emails or whatever. Oh, I start grabbing also a um, slide from our uh, colleague. So the feedback uh, here um, is um, what Ifremer, so the, uh, I, I used to say marine agency, now apparently their English website say Institute for Ocean Science. But at the end of the day, what they, what they do is deploy sensor things API on top of their Argo network, uh, that's an international network of boys that drift along the ocean, and then they dive, they take measurement at different depths, they broadcast data, and they dive again like that. This is mapped to Sensor Things API, ONM then Sensor Things API model, and exposed um, using Sensor Things API, of course. What's interesting is that um, that's a mixture of uh, time series, Z series, because they dive, they take sample, and they also include sample values. They have trajectory, you have that here. And they're so stoked about the, the, the standard. They also were pushing SOS. They, they were part of, like us, of the Inspire groups of, on SOS, but we all moved to Sensor Things API. And we also pushed those ID in, in various uh, domain projects we have. So this is another screenshot of what Ifremer is doing on their Argo Network boys. That's the end, end point of their, uh, of their API, not, not the client. And that's the way they handle, depending on uh, which properties or monitoring, either trajectory, profiles, and stuff. Our agronomic institute in France as well, uh, national nationwide, is also doing the same uh, transition to sensor things API. So that's an example on the national soil database. They mapped their uh, the historical legacy uh, national database on um, soil samples, right, to sensor things API. And that's an example of uh, how uh, organic carbon measurement on a sample, uh, a soil sample, uh, looks like mapped to sensor things API. And then what they did is they ported their model once 
the prototype phase was okay and validated, and push that to production. Here, they are also using a Frost server. The e by the way, was not using a Frost server. They use their own uh, deployment. They funded to a French company, OGC Active, that is called Geomatis as well. And at the end of the day, yeah, on the web client, that's an example on Guyana, you can just click for a uh, soil uh, sample plot. And you have the, the, um, the agronomic value for the various uh, soil layers. And as I mentioned in the intro, uh, the interest is growing within, as you saw, a French research organization, but also across organization to share data in research organization in research infrastructures. This is an example I grabbed from uh, the, the research infrastructure in France uh, regarding the critical zones. So again, it's really mixing geology, soil, hydro, and the atmosphere uh, for the information. We are working jointly with that research infrastructure to define uh, sense sourcing API guidelines to share uh, data across a uh, French research organization that here that's interested using sense sourcing API and broadcast it again uh, to, uh, to other uh, systems. And the, the interest is even more growing. So last year, we had a, through that list, that is the, now the, how can I say that? The list we, we used more and more across French research organization uh, to discuss around fair data. Uh, that's interesting because fair data is really more and more important, especially for research organization, but also abroad, as you saw from Francesca introduction on the GC. And we had so many questions about sensor data. Should people stick to source? Should they move to sensor things? Uh, should they do something else? We had a specific workshop uh, webinar on sensor things, more an intro one that lasted a day. And uh, you had some of the examples I reused. And we're progressively moving to uh, hands on trainings and stuff. So that's really nice. We also heard about, I discovered that today. Uh, I don't remember how you named that, but that's the OGC. Um, how did you name that, Francesca? The OGC. <laughs> I will find that school or something like that campus would be great to, to, to think on that, uh, synchronize on that. Um, okay, that's a quick overview of dynamics we've got in France. Uh, two of them are stemming outside Europe and through OGC. So we are uh, quick feedback on two interoperability uh, experiments. So one is the geotechnical interoperability experiment which is co-led by BRGM, uh, was by my colleague Mikael, who is also online. Uh, Mikael, I think for the sake of time, I just go through the slide. Um, Mikael gave me the link to the, the wiki. Uh, that's under the Geoscience Domain Working Group umbrella for GC, which Mikael co-chairs as well. Different members, especially what is important here, it's not on, for GC focused, you have Building Smart International, AGS. So it's opening to BIM world many communities as well, and the context is exposing uh, ge geotechnical in-situ measurements. And here, that's a focus on the part regarding uh, using sensor things API as a backbone. There are different types of measurements. Um, I'm not a specialist on those, the acronym there, but that's geotechnics, different types of measurements. That challenges, like uh, sharing Z series. And uh, the fact is that the uh, board itself is, is a tra is, um, is a reference system somehow because the measurements are taken along the, along the trajectory of the borehole. So that's an example <laughs> of a non-straight borehole trajectory, some various geotechnical measurement results. There is another IE, interoperability experiment under OGC, we're also driving with the help of the Internet of Water uh, US, I forgot the US here. This one is under the OGC Hydro Domain Working Group umbrella. A lot of members, you can see WMO, UNESCO, uh, US EPA, various side of the world, go down also to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, our context here um, is to expose water quality uh, measurement, surface and groundwater across organizations, of course. That's a mixture of in situ sensor, one time measurements, sample, and sub samples, and sub sub samples. A lot of uh, that could go to biota, fauna flora observation, and we have a lot of control vocabularies to, this to deal with. So the backbone of this one is observation measurement and sample on the semantic side and the backbone of on the API side is sensor things API and OGC API feature. So that's also an important dynamic work that has been emerging and going on. Going on. Last point uh, <coughs> that is important is uh, funding uh, through all those experiment uh, exercises I presented. 
uh, evolution in open source tools. So on our side, we mainly have funds in them first. Uh, and uh, I mentioned like from our funding activities and other open source implementation of sensor things. And we plan as well uh, to um, port to QGIS core the STA plugin coming from the Airbrook project. So that that's a complete a streamlined um, round trip from server to client side. That's really a quick tour. <laughs> And uh, thanks to Katie Mika and, Mika and all the colleagues at that presentation uh, to fit content for, uh, to fit that presentation. If you have a question, let me know. Thank you very much, Sylvain. Now I give the stage to Hilke. Thank you. Okay. Yes, we Hilke can share. Please. Now everybody sees him, sees me double, always like that. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Yes, perfect. Excellent, so um, my name is Hilke van der Schaaf. Um, I am a co-chair of the standardization group in OGC that uh, creates the Sensor Things API. And I'm also the author of one of the uh, server implementations of the Sensor Things API called Frost Server. Um, and uh, today I'll um, give a bit of a live demonstration of some of the implementations in smart city context that exist uh, around the, the world. So um, <coughs> my first demo is uh, from uh, Hamburg. Hamburg has a uh, a geo portal, and they have one of the biggest um, sensor things implementations that I know of. Um, they uh, they manage uh, about up to ten thousand measurements per second, and one of the things they measure is traffic light status. So what you're seeing here right now um, is uh, lots of blinking lights, and these are actual traffic lights. So um, here on the top left, we've got a big crossing. And we can see that um, right now, uh, these pedestrians are green. And now these cars have to a green light. Actually, that's the other way around. They're driving this, this traffic light down here that's green. So right now, this crossing is uh, green for pedestrians. You can see the pedestrian crossing here changing. And um, now this traffic light went red, so cars have to stop. Um, so Sensor Things API is not just about getting um, historic data. You can also get push information about the latest measurements as they happen. So, an example also from Hamburg is um, share pipes and whether they are available or not. So it's the same geo portal. I just changed the background map. Um, and my, there they are coming. We've got little, lots of little bikes. So there's bike sharing is quite popular in, uh, in Germany and in many other countries as well. Of course, um, if you want, if you're traveling somewhere and you're arriving at uh, the main station, you want to know, well, when I get there, can I get a bike? Well, if you get there right now, there is one bike available at the at this bike sharing station in in Hamburg. And here you also see the, the 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 progress in the last few hours. So at night there are quite a few bikes available, and then in the morning they're all gone, which is quite typical for train stations. This one has the same pattern. And this one, uh, this one is a bit more available. And if you go further away from the train station, there's fewer bikes in total, but you've got more chance that there is a bike available. There's not that much of a peak in the morning. And in the evening, all the bikes are brought back. Okay, this one is also close to the main station. And in the morning, when everybody arrives in, in, at, uh, at the train station, they all grab a bike and go further to their destinations.
And another example, charging stations, another one of those things where you want to have the latest information. When you're driving around with your car, you want to know, can I charge my car and where do I have to go to get a place for, to charge my car? And this image I made yesterday evening, there was quite a bit of red. And here there's uh, yeah, still a lot of red. But, uh, so this, this charging station has two charging points and they're both charging, so they're both occupied. And then here's an example. This has two, this charging station has three charging points, but two don't work out of order. This one has three that are completely available. So this is another example. You're traveling into a city and you want to know where are the charging points. And then it's important to have a standard so that you don't need to download an app for Hamburg just to find the charging points in Hamburg. But then you, the next day you travel to a different city and then you need a different app because, well, different city uses a different API. Well, that's something that the Sensor Things API is there for to solve. If all the cities use the Sensor Things API, you only need one app and you're, you can find charging points in any city. And here, of course, you also can get push notifications uh, to see latest, the latest change, so that if you're, uh, you're not driving to a, a station that was reported as being there, but has been occupied in the meantime. Another quite nice example from Hamburg is um, bike counts. Of course, you can count um, you can count traffic, like in the traffic lights example, but you can also count bikes. And in the area, they've, uh, there's an, uh, a couple of cameras installed on this bike, on this, this bridge, or on this point, and here are some more points. And these are infrared cameras. Um, the cameras have a bit of uh, AI in them so that they can, uh, they know what a bike looks like, um, and so they can detect bikes. And then they count bikes for intervals of 15 minutes and send the information, uh, or yeah, and send the information to a central server. So the images themselves are never sent anywhere, um, and the data is also aggregated before it is sent. So you cannot track individual persons. That was uh, very quite very important for the um, privacy, of course. And then you can get uh, statistics. Um, well, let's see. Um, of yesterday, these are um, all the bike traffics, uh, uh, all the bike traffic that passed this point in either direction yesterday. And they've got two more points. Um, this is from west to the east, and the other point is from the east to the west. So you can also see, uh, maybe we can actually see a difference here. It's always interesting to try. Here we see a sharp peak in the morning when everybody goes to work, and then in the in the end at the end of the day the peak is a bit broader because some people work longer, some people work shorter. But this is always interesting to see the sharp peak in the morning. Now the interesting thing, of course, is since the API is an open standard, so. Um, you can have multiple uh, uh, implementations that all uh, read this standard. So here's a completely different uh, web system. This is our uh, web genesis uh, system for uh, data management. And here I can show exactly the same data. So this is the, the, the same um, point as you saw in the, in the previous map, but a different system for visualizing it. And here I can also show, um, for instance, uh, the traffic for a week. And um, so different different clients, but the same data. So you can have multiple clients. You can have multiple clients that all read the same data. You're not stuck to whatever app the city it makes itself. If you don't like that app, or, or if you think I have a use case that also needs the data, you can use the data because it's available in a standardized way. An excellent example uh, from Berlin. Berlin also does uh, bike accounts. And um, they uh, use partly uh, the same platform that Hamburg uses. 
and they also have uh, a nice image of the location where the count is. This is not a live image because otherwise this guy would have fallen from his bike already. Um, and here you can also, um, it's a bit of a different user interface because here you can select whether you want to have the, the direction, both directions. Um, and instead of having different points on the map, they've sorted with a drop down box. So in the direction of Charlottenburg or in the direction of Mitte. And here you can also select whether you want to see the hourly aggregates or the 15 minute aggregates. So here there is about uh, 400 bikes in an hour passing by this point. <coughs> um, Berlin also counts cars on the highway. So again, same interface. Um, there we go. This is the highway that's going straight through Berlin. And this is the highway around Berlin. And here they use um, induction loops in the in the in the road to tra to track uh, cars and, and and lorries. So if we look at uh, well today we see uh, about uh, twenty car twenty tra um, twenty lorries per minute passing by at this point. And um, Oh, no, this is 20 cars per minute passing by on this point and the speed well here you saw the speed was quite good and then there was obviously a traffic jam because the speed was dropped down to quite a lot to around 30 kilometers an hour normally around the drive around uh, 80 90 here <coughs> they also count trucks oh, there's quite a, a lot less trucks per minute and also in the trucks you can also see the speed the trucks have a maximum speed of around 80 so most trucks indeed drive around 80. And then here was traffic jam around uh, rush hour. And then it went up again and down a bit. And then uh, it's stable again. Um, a bit more experimental uh, site um, in the city of Erfurt. We, uh, we're experimenting with, um, with parking garages. So here we've got an, uh, a parking garage um, near the center of Erfurt. And there we can also see um, the capacity. It has place for 30 cars. And then the occupation is how many cars are really there. And then we show it for a week. You can see when the car, when it's getting busy around in the morning, around eight in the morning, people start arriving. And then they leave again. But usually there's a few spots available. So if you're looking for a car spot near in near the center of Erfurt, that's usually a good bet where you'll find a find a place. Let's see uh, if the others are all uh, that nice. Different car park um, capacity. That's a lot bigger. Has capacity of 200. And um, it seems to be always the same filling uh, level. I guess that's uh, not the most reliable sensor. Oh no, this one might be that. Ah, it's this one. They had 700 cars in a parking lot with a capacity of 200. I guess there's something not quite correct in that data. Or maybe this is the capacity. Ah, this is the capacity. They've got, uh, they've, okay, they've got mixed, they've got a long-term storage, a long-term parking with 200, and a short-term parking with 700 places. And here you see, well, it was actually full. They had 715 cars in the parking lot. And uh, also effort is, is counting traffic. So this is an example. Um, Of effort, uh, effort loading of effort. Uh, here you see the, the traffic nets, uh, traffic, uh, all the roads, all the main roads. So if we look at the highway here, um, we can see um, and, uh, the count of cars, vehicles per hour up to 1600. And then at night, it's a lot less, of course. Um, and they've got a speed 
so yeah, uh, the average speed. So uh, during the day, uh, there's traffic jams, lots of cars, low speed. And then at night, few cars, high speed. So here you can clearly see uh, that traffic data, the speed and the number of cars are, are linked together. Some examples of smart city data, um, live, online. Um, thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, I think we've got a question around at the end. Thank you very much, Hilken. And now, last but not least, Luca. There Hello, everybody. Go. Can you hear me? I hope so. And Can you hear Luca? Probably you have to switch your microphone. I'm, I'm, I'm using the, the um, room's microphone, but if it doesn't work, so they cannot hear me. I'll use mine. Uh, I, I, yeah, I was using this. Yeah. Can you give us a, a, a sign if, uh, if it's working? Can anyone hear me? Can yeah. anyone hear me? A thumb up? So. Not well. Why not well? Can anyone hear me? No? Um, we can hear you through the, through the webcam. No worries. Yeah, that's great. Please go ahead. What about now? Can you hear me? Now? Yes? No? Hilke, you have a, it, you are the only one with it's your low. camera on, so if you hear uh, Luca, please. Okay, about. thanks. Great. Thanks, Sylvain. Okay. We are kidding him. So, you hear me and you hopefully are able to see me. Like so. We have seen you at least five times. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't understand that. Yeah, yeah, we are not seeing your presentation. You are not seeing my no. presentation, no. Uh, that's a problem because the thing here is saying that I'm sharing my screen. Uh, let's try again. It says that I'm sharing my screen, so. Ah, then I'll try again the sharing. Stop sharing and then let's try again. Start sharing. Ah, oh, okay, sorry. I made the usual mistake of sharing just a part of the screen. Sorry. I, I blame the others when they do it, but now I did it. So, um, sorry. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. So, hello everybody. I'm Luca Giovannini and I work for DataNext. Um, and I will um, present you our own implementation of Sensor Things that we have de developed in uh, two projects, in two different projects. Um, Airbreak, uh, project based uh, par partly uh, that has a pilot in Ferrara, in the city of Ferrara. Uh, where I am now, and um, another implementation that we did for Project Highlander based in Trentino, a region uh, in Italy. Just a very few words about uh, DataNext, uh, my company. It's a, um, a software and uh, services company, and we have a, um, a research and development department uh, that focuses on many activities, but specifically on those fields related to, um, to smart city and sustainability. Um, and within this framework, uh, we developed uh, our own implementation of, uh, well, actually, we, we <laughs> leveraged on, on a, uh, an existing implementation of Sensor Things API. Um, that is the uh, Frost one that uh, we, we had the uh, 
honor of, of uh, listening to them in the previous presentation. So the, ju just to be uh, just as a quick idea of what's the architecture that we used, uh, it's it's centered on the on the um, Frost server. And it's fed. We, we don't own uh, sensor networks. We we are uh, we actually um, are aggregators. Let's say uh, we we developed um, dashboards that use that that with which you can uh, show and and interact with with sensor data. So we. Um, we populate the, um, the the database behind uh, the Frost implementation, connecting to um, IoT sources, and usually, in general, we actually go um, go pull data uh, from those um, sensor sources, and we use uh, Apache NiFi to do to do this. And then, uh, the, uh, the, the of course, as it was mentioned, we, we can then use several uh, several dashboards, several viewers, several tools to access the data and show it and interact with it. We have uh, our own uh, geo portal, which is called GeoNext. Um, we developed a plugin for QGIS that it's going to be further uh, developed. We we will talk a little bit more in detail uh, about this. And of course, you can use uh, whatever else um, visualization device to connect to Frost. So, uh, as I was mentioning, um, I will present uh, data and, and, and results from two projects. So from Airbrake, we uh, plugged into uh, this type of different sensors. So there's uh, air quality sensors from official uh, measuring stations from local agencies. There's air quality data from um, stations, so from sensors that were installed by the uh, municipality of Ferrara. Then uh, data from bike counters and, and um, vehicle traffic measuring, uh, measuring units. And also, uh, it's not available yet, but there will be also air quality data from um, low-cost sensors uh, installed in, in schools and in private, private houses from private citizens. Then in a Highlander project, uh, instead, we were uh, plugging into sensors, very specific sensors for um, uh, environmental monitoring and sensors that monitor the well-being of trees, so things that are plugged into trees to measure how are they growing and how are they how are they doing, basically. Um, then sensors that monitor the fire risk in, in forests and sensors uh, installed on animals that, that, that measure their well their well-being. And of course, um, we we also uh, took advantage of the uh, of some endpoints that were already available regarding air quality, and specifically the uh, the one uh, set up by the Fraunhofer Institute about the th th that's collecting the air quality data from from the whole of Europe uh, and from the data collected by the European Environmental Agency. So um, this is. Uh, the implementation on on the uh, next geoportal, and it, I, what I'm showing now is the um, sensors, the air quality stations, the, the, the stations measuring air quality data in Ferrara, and uh, basically what we did was to develop a plugin that that in, in our intention made it easy to understand. Uh, it, it, everything starts from the locations of the sensor, uh, since it is a geoportal. Then by selecting a sensor, you have access to the list of, of data streams. And by selecting a data stream, you have access to the data either in, in uh, text format or in, uh, in, in, in the form of, of a time series of a graphical format. And of course, you can select different time periods. And you can, uh, well, it's not shown, but you can also download, ask to download the, the, the data you are, just the one that you are visualizing. If, just in case you want to do something more on, on that specific data. Um, then, as I mentioned, we also uh, developed a plugin for QGIS, um, since we felt that, that that could have been useful for other, other people, and we also use a lot uh, QGIS to, uh, to test uh, our developments. 
and uh, basically uh, it, it works as other 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 tools to connect to other uh, data sources so you have you you can you can save some uh, endpoints or you can uh, of course add new ones and and then you you, you connect to the data source in this case it is an endpoint uh, from the frost server of the um, uh, municipality of ferrara and you can choose uh, th there's this we we implemented this feature since we needed to to distinguish between different types of of uh, of sensors and we wanted to keep just one uh, one implementation of the frost server so we used the uh, the property field of the that, that's available for all of the entities um, to distinguish to group in, uh, and characterize in a different way the different groups of sensors so um, basically what you see here is the different labels um, uh, put in the in the properties field there, there's a um, there's an attribute name organization we just chose that the name um, for the lack of, of fantasy, <laughs> we chose that name. And we value organization with different values, and we use that to group the sensors in different groups. So I'm showing now the sensors for, uh, from the, just from the air quality sensor from the municipality of Ferrara, and, and that's it. Um, and of course, then you can, similarly to what we have shown before, uh, in, in for uh, our geopold portal you can select the uh, once you have selected the location you you see the list of available data streams and then you can choose to see the data either in text format or in graphical format and you can again download uh, that specific chunk of data uh, of course, uh, the plugin works with every endpoint that that follows the standard. So uh, this is the uh, the, w w the um, what you can have by connecting to the endpoint the um, endpoint for the air quality data within um, Europe, uh, the, the one that I was mentioning before. And as I was saying again, um, the the plugin groups uh, gr groups um, sensors based on. Uh, the values of the property field of the and uh, of the location entity. So here we and you can choose which of the of the elements of the property field you 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 want to use to group sensors. Here we we chose to group sensors by uh, by the field nationality, so that you can actually see them as different layers. Um, and so that's it. That those are the sensors you can select. Uh, any of them, then select the the data stream and see the data and download it. I saw in the in the chat before that that someone was asking for uh, available um, uh, sensor thing endpoints to test uh, possible new implementations. So I'm also providing a pointing to to the already existing list of those endpoints and. Yeah, again, uh, I, I, I just want to, to, to communicate the fact that uh, we, are, we plan to develop further that, that uh, plugin for QGIS that I've just shown. And hopefully, um, we, we are hoping to, to make it as part, as a core component of, of QGIS, so that's not, no more a plugin, but something that it's available uh, just by downloading uh, QGIS, the new versions of QGIS. But that's, that's to be done. <laughs> And uh, then the, this is just a quick uh, example of the fact that once you have a standard endpoint, then you can create different different uh, different tools to connect to the endpoint and visualize and and and, and show data uh, in a different way. Here we had the necessity of monitoring the the, the fact that the flow of data uh, coming from the air quality sensors to the um, the frost server was actually uh, not interrupted by by any problem so we needed to keep it monitored so we developed a very simple web page uh, that that calls the api and checks for every uh, for every location and every thing connected to every location checks again the data streams uh, that, that that are published and the the last timestamp the last available observation for every data stream and it 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 just shows in yellow if there's uh, some data stream that that's uh, for which the last 
data available, uh, the last observation available, is too far in the past. So that means that some the new observations are, are missing. It's a very simple tool, but it, it, it's up to the task. It's what we needed. And it was really easy because there was the, uh, the endpoint already available. You just had to call it and rearrange the information on the, on the web page. Um, finally, I'll be, I promise I'll be very quick, uh, just to show you the, the types of data we have been working on and the fact that they, they appear the, the same uh, if you use different tools. So this is, uh, the, this is data about tree well-being in GeoNext and in the uh, QGIS plugin. Data about air quality, yeah, again, in GeoNext and, and in the QGIS plugin. And data about car transits in, in, the, in the two settings. And that's it. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Luca and everyone. We are very late uh, due to these technical uh, issues that we had, so I'm very sorry for that. Uh, if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat uh, and maybe we can find a final slot to answer them. Um, but in the meantime, I would proceed to the presentations of the, uh, to the round table. So I'm also very sorry to skip the break. Uh, so if you have to, if you need one minute, uh, please <laughs> run and um, uh, and uh, yes, so I, I would suggest that we continue to do the rest of the presentations because otherwise we cannot, we cannot make it. So I really, I do apologize for that. Uh, okay, I don't need to make a sound anymore. So yeah, we can skip now to the following part of uh, today uh, of today workshop, which is the roundtable with Italian authorities and uh, public offices. Uh, so also go to meeting. Um, <laughs> Okay, so you can have the break for this two minutes that go to meeting is starting again. And um, okay, so this part will be more uh, we intend, is intended for uh, uh, Italian authorities to share their uh, their practices and uh, the data that they, they are using and to share what are their plans for. Uh, uh, for using those data in the future and uh, for using those data through standardized uh, means. So these presentations will be um, some in Italian and some in English, as the speakers prefer. And uh, if you agree, can you, can you see my screen or oh, my sharing? I'm not that. sharing. Okay. So please, the first speaker, uh, Antonio Rotundo from uh, Agenzia per l'Italia Digitale, prepare to speak and the others uh, immediately after. So there will be this very fast round of three, three slides, three minutes. And uh, yes, so we can start. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Antonio Rotundo from the Agency for Digital Italy, uh, where I'm um, uh, engaged in the uh, service uh, data management, uh, where I deal with the uh, data, both open and uh, special, uh, and uh, uh, with the, the the implementation of data policies uh, defined uh, both at uh, European and uh, Italian uh, level. Next slide, please. Um, my, my organization, uh, Agency for, for Digital Italy, doesn't uh, collect and produce uh, uh, data, but uh, it is in charge of defining uh, national uh, rules about uh, 
uh, data policies uh, and uh, strategies. Uh, in, this, uh, with the, in this regard, uh, uh, recently the, the, the Agency for Digital Italy defined, uh, have defined uh, the, um, uh, the national guidelines uh, uh, about uh, open data and the uh, use of public uh, sector information. Uh, the, these, uh, um, these uh, guidelines uh, is the uh, implementation of the uh, national uh, decree tra transposing uh, the, the recent uh, Open Data Directive. In these uh, guidelines, uh, the, uh, um, a specific uh, uh, section is dedicated to dynamic data, that is uh, one of the uh, data type uh, um, identified in the Open Data Directive as uh, uh, data with a high pot socio-economic potential. And uh, uh, in the guidelines, uh, um, the arrangements and the, the, and the specific requirements and recommendations are uh, uh, included uh, for uh, um, to, to, to allow the public uh, administration and uh, other uh, uh, subjects uh, interested, uh, such as uh, public and private uh, undertakings, uh, to implement the arrangements and then the dispositions uh, included in the uh, Open Data Directive. Um, there is, uh, in the guidelines, there is also a clarification, um, a, a clear, uh, um, a clarification between the, uh, about the, the, the relation between the open data and spatial data, and uh, in particular, uh, um, the, 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 the main arrangements is that dynamic data shall be uh, made uh, available through API and uh, uh, with the reference to API, a uh, 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 specific uh, reference to the INSPIRE uh, good practice and the OGC standard is, uh, is uh, included. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next is Oscar Formaggi from Agenzia della Mobilità di, Fer di Ferrara. Sì, grazie, buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti. Eh, provo brevemente, visto, visto il tempo, a dire due parole anch'io. Eh, lavoro come tecnico all'Agenzia della Mobilità qua di Ferrara e, e si occupa principalmente eh, di trasporto pubblico e mobilità in genere. Come mh, focus principale abbiamo quello della gestione del contratto di servizio che regolamenta eh, i mezzi e quindi la gestione del servizio con eh, il principale attore sul um, territorio del bacino ferrarese che è Tiper. E, um, tecnologicamente abbiamo anche altre tipologie di eh, servizi complementari alla mobilità, tra cui anche la gestione tecnologica dei, eh, della mobilità ciclabile. E in questa prospettiva appunto eh, abbiamo, eh, grazie al supporto di, di Deda Group, eh, implementato e distribuito i dati che avevamo disponibili eh, su alcuni di dispositivi cosiddetti contabici che erano ubicati sia all'interno del bacino urbano di Ferrara che eh, eh, in, in alcune zone della provincia e conseguentemente abbiamo sviluppato un prototipo insieme all'Università di Ferrara per poter utilizzare questi dati ecco grazie in maniera uh, dinamica, nel senso che eh, la, uno degli obiettivi che la regione Emilia Romagna si è data negli scorsi anni era quella di gestire in maniera informatizzata tutti i dati della mobilità, ovviamente eh, noi come agenzia eh, abbiamo dovuto eh, prendere questo come nostro obiettivo e abbiamo realizzato un'infrastruttura che ci permettesse di sfruttare questi dati. Eh, inizialmente abbiamo eh, appunto sviluppato un, un prototipo eh, relativo eh, sost sostanzialmente solo alla mobilità ciclabile, però il nostro obiettivo è allargarlo anche ad altri aspetti, in particolare quello che ci sta più eh, a cuore soprattutto per il rapporto che abbiamo con il trasporto pubblico e quello relativo al, um, 
ai dispositivi cosiddetti AVM che sono dispositivi che vanno a bordo mezzo e per questo diciamo eh, sono eh, da, da considerare eh, importanti per quanto riguarda la rendicontazione puntuale che dobbiamo eh, effettuare per capire quanti chilometri eh, le emissioni e quindi ridigere poi anche annualmente i cosiddetti bilanci di sostenibilità. Eh, L'utilizzo di questi dati eh, poi è principalmente eh, utile anche allo scopo di migliorare quelle che sono le linee di trasporto eh, principalmente urbano eh, anche in base alla frequentazione, quindi eventualmente la, la presenza eh, di utenti di servizio eh, più, più o meno importanti a livello di flussi, quindi magari le fermate più utilizzate e così via. Eh, L'obiettivo a medio e lungo termine appunto è quello di eh, sfruttare la sensoristica eh, a bordo mezzo che in questo caso ci viene eh, fornita tramite eh, server regionali e quindi sfruttare questi dati e alimentare un server, una piattaforma che ci permetta di, eh, di leggerli in maniera eh, consona, quindi capire eh, i chilometri, i, gli autobus circolanti nel bacino della provincia, eh, valutare i dati in transito eh, anche in tempo reale. Secondariamente ovviamente è anche l'informazione all'utenza per capire dove si trova un determinato autobus, quindi eh, sfruttare la possibilità data dalla della piattaforma che abbiamo che è stata descritta stamattina, precedentemente, ehm, appunto anche con i dati dell'autobus e quindi questo è il nostro obiettivo futuro. Grazie. Grazie. Thank you. Paolo Veronesi, Arpa e Emilia Romagna. Please. Buongiorno, buongiorno, io sono Paolo Veronesi, mi occupo dell'unità valorizzazione dati e patrimonio informativo di Arpa Emilia Romagna ormai da qualche anno. Sono un biologo e quindi magari può sembrare strano che ci occupiamo di cose informatiche che tipicamente riguardano l'informatica. Crediamo che comprendere anche le matrici di cui si parla, di cui uh, accumuliamo i dati in queste nostre risorse, possa essere un punto di partenza importante per poi organizzare meglio i dati. Prego. Ok, eh, essenzialmente abbiamo un portale oh, che si chiama dati.arpai.it eh, su cui abbiamo i dati eh, del, okay, questa qua. Abbiamo i nostri dati uh, di tutte le matrici che andiamo ad analizzare. Tipicamente abbiamo dati in real time, che sono quelli che arrivano dalle reti regionali che producono dati in real time, per esempio la, la rete de regionale della qualità del dell'aria, sono in realtà in real time, ma li pubblichiamo a seguito di validazione, quindi hanno vari step di validazione successiva e a seguito della validazione finiscono sul portale. Abbiamo invece serie temporali di dati riguardanti le matrici di aria, le acque superficiali, le acque sotterranee, le acque di transizione e marine che vanno indietro di 10-15 anni e dati meteorologici che invece vanno indietro di 60 anni. Pubblichiamo anche i dati previsionali, in genere da modelli matematici, quindi questi sono dati più recenti che abbiamo dagli ultimi 5-6 anni e che pubblichiamo quando facciamo le previsioni, quindi per i giorni successivi e poi archiviamo per i controlli degli altri utenti che magari vogliono fare una verifica dei loro modelli in base ai risultati dei nostri modelli. Gestiamo centralmente la metadatazione e la pubblicazione dei dati Aggiorniamo automaticamente molti di questi dataset e avviene l'harvesting automatico della regione Emilia Romagna di tutti i dati che stanno sul portale Cicano. La successiva, grazie. Eh, le nostre idee per il futuro, che in parte abbiamo già implementato, sono sicuramente cercare di pubblicare tutto sul portale Developers Italia, tutti gli script e le modalità di valorizzazione del dato di cui ci siamo dotati e di cui ci doteremo. Abbiamo acquistato in questi mesi con i fondi PNRR dei droni aerei, ne abbiamo cinque a questo punto, abbiamo un drone marino che utilizzeremo per fare mappatura tridimensionale e andare sul dettaglio 
di sorgenti che normalmente, eh, di cui normalmente conosciamo poco o che magari possiamo vedere dal satellite, ma la cui risoluzione è piuttosto scarsa rispetto a quello che ci può servire. Implementiamo una rete di smart sensor con dati in real time, ne abbiamo comprati una trentina di varie marche e analizziamo questi dati con algoritmi di intelligenza artificiale, fra l'altro abbiamo un corso, un caso studio che si occupa dei cambiamenti climatici e del cambio di fioritura nelle piante e anche una collaborazione con la regione Emilia Romagna proprio per l'analisi con l'intelligenza artificiale dei dati degli smart sensor. Grazie. Grazie. Thank you. No, Stefano Livucci, area dati, settore innovazione digitale. Buona. Sì, buongi buongiorno a tutti, eh, anche io sono abbastanza breve. Regione Emilia Romagna, di cui c'è un'infrastruttura di dati geografici eh, che espone una serie di dati, di dataset prodotti dalla pubblica amministrazione, dalla Regione Emilia Romagna in particolare, nei vari diversi settori eh, ed espone anche eh, un catalogo dei dati soprattutto. Eh, I dati sono spesso esposti eh, da, da, dall'area e dall'infrastruttura geografica attraverso dei servizi eh, OGC, UMS e UFS ed è questo di cui noi ci occupiamo, quindi produciamo dei dati, eh, congestiamo un'infrastruttura dati per tutti i settori della regione Emilia Romagna e spesso adesso inizia anche a essere utilizzata da alcuni enti locali e rendiamo fruibili i dati attraverso i servizi di fruizione i geoportali ed applicazioni WebGIS, questo è un po' il lavoro che noi facciamo. In questo senso noi eh, appunto, siccome pubblichiamo dati essenzialmente prodotti dalla pubblica amministrazione intesa come l'ente regione Emilia Romagna, non abbiamo molta esperienza come ente nella produzione di dati dinamici. Abbiamo alcune attività, ad esempio eh, l'esempio che posso portare di un potenziale eh, dato dinamico è quello di, delle centraline eh, legate ai flussi di traffico che sono comunque dati rilevati eh, ad ogni ora come, come frequenza temporale e che sono attualmente disponibili ma non esposti come servizi quindi questo potrebbe essere un dato un esempio di dato che potremmo trasformare in un dato dinamico esposto eh, ci sono altri potenziali dati raccolti nel corso di o di indagini statistiche che formalmente l'ente deve fare oppure anche c'è uno studio su eh, ricavare dei dati da quelle che sono le pratiche amministrative quindi dati raccolti anche dai sistemi SAS per esempio, quindi in tempo reale. C'è il problema dell'esposizione, del eh, de seguire le normative, ad esempio della privacy, per esporre questi dati. Peraltro noi invece cercheremo di svolgere il ruolo di collettori, quindi di un'infrastruttura e di un catalogo di dati geografici che stiamo intendendo non solo come ente, ma come territorio, e quindi cercare di veicolare opportunamente i catalogati anche i dati prodotti ad esempio da ARPE che sono appena stati citati, con i quali naturalmente c'è una strettissima collaborazione. Già adesso noi gestiamo un'infrastruttura di dati eh, entro e eh, compliant con eh, il repertorio nazionale dei dati territoriali e con Inspire, per intendere che espone attraverso i servizi OGC eh, i dati e eh, eh, espone anche i metadati, su questo vorremmo portare anche eventualmente, insieme ai colleghi di Alfa, ad esempio, dati, eh, dati dinamici. Per noi questa è una sfida, è una cosa nuova, quindi siamo molto interessati a, a, al workshop e ai contenuti che sono stati esposti e anzi ringrazio dell'invito a partecipare. Direi che questi sono gli elementi essenziali. Grazie. Luisa Vaccaro, Ispra. Sì? sì. Eccomi. Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning. Um, I'm Luisa Vaccaro and I've been working uh, for ISPA since uh, 2000. Um, ISPA is the Italian Institute for Environmental Protection and Research and um, It is um, uh, the national reference institution uh, for the SNPA, 
SNPA is uh, composed by ISPRA and the regional and provincial, uh, provincial uh, agencies uh, for the autonomous provinces um, for the protection and, and uh, the, uh, of the environment. And uh, um, SNPA is, uh, uh, was established with the law, a national law, uh, 132, the number 132 on uh, 2016. Um, I work in uh, the service uh, that in ISPA deals with uh, uh, the SINA, is uh, the National Environmental Information Service, and uh, the task uh, the task of the SINA are mainly um, collecting, processing, and disseminating uh, uh, environmental and territorial data and um, <clears throat> providing uh, uh, official data for public administration and uh, producing uh, indicators, uh, time series, uh, uh, near real-time data and uh, linked open data. Uh, data and geographic information collected by uh, ISPAD and uh, SNPA are stored and made public and accessible also in uh, near real time at web address uh, here shown. Um, <clears throat> and the data, um, the data are published uh, as part uh, of the uh, SINA, uh, which, which uh, guarantees uh, uh, as a rule of uh, uh, guarant, uh, that guarantees the effective link between uh, um, the initiatives implemented by the various subjects in the collection and the organization of data uh, and uh, guarantees the consistence, uh, uh, the consistent maintenance of the information flows and the, the divulgation of data uh, to the public administration, uh, to the researchers and the experts and uh, to all the citizens. Um, uh, among the, the dynamic data, um, the I. Uh, updating frequency. Uh, there are the near real time data about air quality and the linked and open data related to dynamic data of uh, uh, national web matrix network and the uh, national tidal network. Uh, the TAT gauges are placed in ports and uh, measure um, parameters as, uh, such as uh, air temperature, uh, humidity, water temperature, and uh, it's uh, pH uh, hourly. The boys uh, of the wave measurement network are also located offshore and uh, all the, the parameters uh, um, such as uh, air temperature, and, uh, humidity, and the uh, sea surface temperature and uh, wave A uh, hourly. Uh, the web application for near real time high quality data instead published uh, uh, at website others um, uh, here reported. Uh, it presents data on seven main pollutants for every monitor station. It's possible uh, to access to hourly data in near real time with a, a delay of uh, two, three hours. Um, for daily parameters, that are the particular matter ones. It's possible to access the data related to the last uh, uh, 30 days. In the load area are available GSV files for each region and the pollutant. And um, instead, um, uh, moreover, as regards uh, uh, linked open data, all data sets are published according to RDF standard, uh, which can be consulted with a sparkle endpoint at uh, the web address here um, indicated. Um, near real time data. Uh, Hourly updated are available in GSV format uh, in the, at this web address. Then, um, the third slide some ideas for future um, for uh, the two uh, type of data um, linked open data, uh, also uh, taking into account uh, the activities of the uh, Department of Digital Transformation um, of the Presidency of the Council of Ministers of Italy. Uh, IFPA will publish the ontologies that uh, um, can be modeled the observation, the indicators, and then the measurement station associated with a generic uh, environmental data set. 
for uh, what uh, turn um, near real time for the data, um, during the next few months, ISPA will publish the data on uh, uh, real time air quality. Um, based on data models uh, that uh, are um, spy compliance uh, with the standard uh, with the standard of spy and uh, available through appropriate uh, api at the same time the related metadata will be um, submitted in uh, the uh, national directory of territorial data of agid agency for ITA digital italy or the RMDT catalog. Um, it's all. Thank you very much. Um, Stefano Livucci, I think. We already, yes, I'm sorry, simply some mistake in my slides. Okay, so I think all of you have, um, have presented. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I had the, yes, just to double check, exactly. Great. Uh, so, we can pass to the following part about the presentation of European projects and um, if, if there is anyone else uh, also from public administrations in Italy uh, who has not shared maybe the slides but wants to add something about uh, this, maybe we can do a final uh, uh, round uh, after this, uh, this session. So now I'm taking the slides for projects, so here. Uh, and uh, please, the first one, go ahead and show. Yeah, do you, do you hear me, see me? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, Mario here from uh, No Center in Graz, Austria. I'm the uh, Chief Scientific Officer of the, the, the ACU project. Uh, Pier Giorgio from Data Next uh, is also uh, a partner uh, uh, in this project, and um, yeah, so uh, the project is mainly uh, 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 evolving around uh, indoor air quality. Uh, we are one of the seven projects uh, which was granted in this call, um, and. Uh, the idea is to kind of gather um, evidence on a large scale how indoor air uh, quality is affecting uh, mainly children's health. Uh, so uh, we can go to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so uh, we have several uh, pilots and uh, measurements cam measurement uh, campaigns in the project. Um, since we also have uh, many partners, we are in total 18 partners, and uh, one of the pilots is uh, in Ferrara in Italy, driven by uh, Data Next and uh, Lab Service Analytica. Then we have a, a pilot project in um, Zagreb, Croatia, uh, which is being conducted by um, one, uh, two Croatian and one uh, Greek company, so who are, uh, Greek company who is also a sensor producer. Then we have a, a also a sensor producer and a pilot in, uh, in Estonia. Uh, we have a campaign in Sevilla in, in Spain and one in uh, Vilnius in Lithuania. And since we have so many um, uh, kind of uh, different uh, campaigns uh, at uh, multiple locations and uh, different sensor providers, it was uh, um, an important aspect of the project to include um, data interoperability and uh, this task is uh, actually being uh, led by, uh, by Data Next, by, by Pier Giorgio. So uh, um, data interoperability and all of these standards uh, which uh, we have heard today are uh, quite an important aspect and we hope that all sensor providers will um, adapt to those standards 
uh, so OCG, and uh, apply them uh, in their kind of uh, the daily operations. So all of those data should be uploaded one day to the Joint Research Council. Um, yeah, okay, my other things are now popping up. Um, so we, uh, besides kind of having uh, sensor data, uh, we also have metadata, which is quite relevant, so regarding buildings, etc. And um, yes, uh, one of the main challenges is to uh, how to how to deal with uh, individuals or personal data, so occupancy, behavior, etc. Also according uh, to GDPR, and um, how to align all of the sensor producers to uh, to adapt to those standards and um, to have a nice workflow for all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Now the next project, Highlander and Sebastian. Giovanni Vignali, please go ahead. Good morning to everyone. I'm Giovanni Vignali. I'm a computational biologist from University of Tusha. And I thank you, the usage project, to invite me today for this workshop. Today I will present you the Islander and Sebastian European project. The main focus of Islander is the animal well-being and to ensure uh, the animal well-being to prevent the impact of climate change. For example, as we all know, climate change are producing more and more frequent extreme event. For example, a heat wave during summer. For this reason, we are developing using IoT new tools to help farmers to challenge this event. Next slide, please. How our IoT system is working? We are using sensors which are positioned on different parts of the animals, and each sensor is reading specific data. For example, we have a collar, which is reading air temperature and humidity. All this data from the sensor are collected from the animal main device, which will publish this data on the first server. The first server so will collect the data from all the sensors, store them, and organize them. This data can be visualized through a Grafana dashboard. This data can help the farmer to the management of the animal. For example, as we have seen before, and it's stress during summer. This sensor has a public license data, which is available on the Alander data portal. Next slide, please. And which are the plans for the future? Since Islander is recently ended, we are continuing with Sebastian project. So our objective is to increase the number of animals which are monitored. For example, Olsen breed. We will include new type of sensor. For example, a skin temperature. We will also create a system for real-time warning. And uh, all these sensors will also be used in the framework of the Agritech project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, your presentations. And uh, now Joan Mazo has to leave us. So since I'm not <laughs> stressed enough today, I'll try to say a few words um, about AD4GD as well. So this is an Horizon project, it's a sister project of Usage, uh, and uh, I'm talking about it because OGC is also involved in this one. I wonder if you hear me? Yes. Hi, Joan. Please. Okay. I mean, I'm in the translation, so I, I don't know how long I can do that, but anyway. Uh, yes, you say it. Uh, this, is a, this is a project that should help develop the Green Deal data space. Uh, the Green Deal data space is an idea of the Commission. Uh, they really want uh, all this uh, data that can be used to assess the Green Deal available from one place. And, uh, well, that's, that's the challenge. 
So what we what we want to do so is uh, actually working the fragmenting the the actual environment of, of data, but also uh, exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, so our proposal is about uh, yeah the, to try and make uh, more data openly available using the building blocks created by by the OGC and so on um, on some of the standards uh, and also integrating uh, the sensor thing API actually. So it's about integration integration and integration we should focus on the end users the our solution it's about using interoperability but not not only uh, at the service level but also at the semantic interoperability level because if we want to integrate uh, data that comes from citizen science for for IOT uh, and uh, remote sensing and in situ and so on we really need to understand each other so semantics is going to be key it is all also being key the trust on the on the data so data quality descriptions should be should be there if you go next now I will present uh, those uh, use cases. Actually, we have uh, three use cases. The, there are one use case in Berlin. This is about uh, water quality uh, in lakes. So what we are going to do is in situ measurements uh, from IoT and citizen science. We are going to do biodiversity dynamics and corridors in the Mediterranean, in the metropolitan sorry, area of Barcelona. Uh, in here, we will have in situ, we will have uh, IoT, we will have citizen science, but we also will have remote sensing maybe for land cover change. And finally, we have uh, an air quality that uh, most probably is going to happen in the nor northern Italy uh, with low cost uh, sensors uh, mounted on DHL tracks, uh, but this is still to be confirmed. So if you go next, you will see that, uh, okay, that's the one. Uh, that uh, we have these tasks on integrating different things and uh, in particular internet of things and citizen science is where the sensor thing api could could uh, play a role but uh, there are difficulties and the difficulties are the iot people they have their own stuff so they talk about Firewire, and they talk about uh, TMF, uh, and uh, other standards that I have. I, I actually don't know a word about them, uh, so I really need to find out. Uh, and this is uh, one of the challenges. We will see how we, we could harmonize that with uh, with Sensor Thing API or use it together or whatever. And in citizen science, we also have challenges because because in citizen science we need the presence of the citizens. And if you remember the the, di the diagram describing the different objects in in sensor things there is nothing to describe the individual person that got the, the, the data there is nothing to describe your license uh, that could be different from each user so this is something that we have been working on uh, on uh, best practice that you have the URL there uh, suggesting some improvements and extensions that we also implemented in the frost implementation we call it frost, frost plus and you can have it on the under uh, on the secure dimensions github uh, next and uh, I wanted to trick you into another slide that is com a completely different project. This is uh, something called uh, City Ops. This is a project that started just, you know, uh, two or three days ago. And uh, it's all about sensor thing API. If you look at the diagram, uh, you will be able to spot that protocol here and there and everywhere. Because, uh, again, we want to use uh, sensor thing API as the glue that holds uh, all these uh, data sets uh, that sit different citizens in air quality are producing. Uh, but as I said, uh, we are at the beginning, so we are trying to convince the different actors that's the right thing to do. So we will see uh, what happens. I will tell you in uh, two or three years. Uh, and I believe that's all. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Now we still have usage. Uh, here... <coughs> Oscar, I, uh, yes, I will take it to just. Yeah. So I have to talk to the microphone? Or yes, you have to come here and talk to the microphone. Yes. <coughs> and I'm. Um,
interested to see the definition of the green deal data space that usage has, that might be a little bit different from mine. <laughs> exactly, we were, we were talking about this, Joan. <laughs> we will still have to talk a little bit more. Okay, please, okay, is yeah. yours. From, from this, I mean, like, uh, in very simple terms, I mean, I have been creating this uh, right on the spot, and I will only use uh, examples uh, from the city of Zaragoza because we uh, we already uh, were talking about this uh, a few days ago. Um, I can go, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, which are... Open the camera. Ah. Oh. So they can see you. So they can see me. Hello. <laughs> How are you? So... Basically, I mean, like, uh, I have taken uh, just examples of some of these sensor data sources that we are going to be using. From the case of Zaragoza that we were discussing and we have been uh, going through the, uh, through the data catalog uh, all these days as well, I mean, like, uh, trying to refine it. And uh, this is just an example of things that are going to also happen in the other uh, cities that are involved in, in usage, uh, which are Ferrara, uh, Graz, uh, and Leuven. Uh, so, I mean, we have over here as examples uh, air quality uh, data, yeah, both the data that we sense and the data that we predict, yeah, and uh, this will be something that we will be, uh, we will be looking into because, I mean, it may be a nice case also for the sensor things uh, API. Uh, we have also another interesting uh, area on heat islands. Uh, again, I mean, like, uh, this is taken from both in situ observations and uh, from the processing of earth observation data. And again, I mean, it's something that could be uh, provided from uh, using uh, this type of API. And finally, in terms of environment, we will be working with the noise maps, yeah, uh, according to some of the, uh, the existing directives. So I have a little bit more detail on each of these ones, but I mean, it's just, just for the purpose of uh, like showing them. I know, I know, I mean, that uh, we are a little bit uh, pressed by time, but I mean, just just to give you an idea, uh, this is the current visualization. Nothing. Nothing really, uh, really strange in, in that sense. I mean, it's not using uh, any specific API for the time being. It's only a data set that can be used, I mean, to access uh, observations. In terms of the uh, predictions of air quality, uh, they want to go much further, not just the weather, st I mean, well, uh, the stations that are used for air quality, uh, but also, I mean, applying uh, models uh, that can obtain uh, uh, like a little bit more detail, fine-grained detail on the air quality in different streets uh, of Zaragoza. And I mean, this will be uh, starting to be available uh, by the end of this uh, year. And it's part of the, the um, compromises yeah, of, the, of the city council. Uh, in terms of heat islands, uh, you can just see, I mean, uh, um, uh, that it is also starting right now. I mean, they are having now a WMS uh, service and they are also thinking about how to provide the data in a better manner uh, so that it is more reusable. For them, it's only like a map, a layer yeah, that you can put, you can click, get some piece of data, but that's, that's all, yeah? And finally, in terms of the noise maps, uh, again, I mean, this is uh, a need that they have uh, recently identified. Uh, this is very related to one of the uh, regulations uh, where they should be providing this data uh, with uh, many more uh, updates or uh, much more clearly. And uh, I mean, they will be working very fast on this because uh, they are, they know that they are already late. Yeah. I mean, so uh, they, they had some work that they were doing in the past and they will be uh, seeing, I mean, how, how this can be done in a, in a better manner. So this is all uh, that I wanted to, uh, to comment. I mean, I can just uh, go back into the main list of uh, sensor data and that's all. Yeah. Thank you very much, Oscar. Any question for uh, any of the speakers so far? So if not, we can try to uh, to do this. So we we still have half an hour, so we are surprisingly in time, <laughs> and uh, we can use this half an hour for the discussion as well for seeing. Uh, so please go to menti.com and use this code. I can pass it in the chat. Uh, where is the chat? Yeah. And um, and we can really make some more some more guided discussion. Uh, unless you have any comments to to tell, in that case, please feel free to open your microphone and uh, and speak. 
which is for the codes. Yes, okay, uh, can you? It's in the chat. Four seven nine six three four eight two. Thank you. Okay, it's also here in the slide. So first question is what are about the obstacles that must hinder the sensor things uptake uh, in uh, your organization and uh, we are mostly interested about uh, the opinions and the views uh, from uh, public authorities of course or uh, yeah You can answer in English or Italian, uh, as you prefer, so no worries about that. Some more answers. Okay, so I wait, I will, a few more minutes, like, one more minute and then we can uh, uh, open a bit the discussion about uh, these, around these answers. <clears throat> so, ignorance about the standard is popping up. That's a uh, that's good for justifying the workshop of today and uh, a good ground for the OGC Academy uh, starting, I would say. And then we have right implementation organizational aspects and issues, um, data sources, mapping data models. Okay, so I, I would invite you to, to comment on these, uh, uh, on these results. So maybe, for example, I'm rather curious about uh, um, about what are the organizational problems and uh, and issues and aspects that are there. So, uh, quali sono i problemi di organizzazione che che sono più più importanti, è più difficile da superare. So, what are the major issues about that? Can anyone uh, answer this uh, and elaborate a bit of, on this? Please don't be shy. Uh, 
maybe we need to be more specific about how, what organizational means. Yes, that, that's what I would like to know. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm not intervening because intervening because I'm uncertain which kind of organizational stuff we are talking about. Are we talking about procurements uh, in the organization? Are we talking about the people that don't know how to deploy that? Are we talking about how to organize the data? Uh, I, I mean, all of these things could be, you know, barriers. Um, ok, quindi chi ha scritto problemi di organizzazione, se ha voglia di raccontare qualcosa di più, sarebbe benvenuto. Otherwise we can elaborate more on other uh, things, uh, like uh, for example, uh, data sources. Uh, why? data sources is an obstacle. In what sense? What do you mean? Okay, so please, uh, may I come here? We have it here mm -hmm. on the audience. Who, who uh, wrote I wrote it, and I meant like uh, data availability from uh, the data producers, that every data producers, if they don't adopt uh, common standards in making uh, the data available, is more difficult to uh, to make the matching with the sense of things at the end. Thank you, Raniero. Uh, anyone uh, uh, wants to comment on this? One thing that I could say is that uh, most of the sensors actually don't talk sensor thing API. Uh, so this forces us into into somehow adding a different layer that translate the sensor protocol into uh, something else. So maybe we need the sensors that are writing to the, to, to the database uh, using some kind of a back protocol, let's call it a backdoor, and then we, we have the sensor thing API offering the, the data from the other stream. And uh, so there should be some kind of a different ways of, of doing this connection, and I believe the, this is the, the, the most difficult part. Uh, sensors are becoming more and more intelligent, so they have uh, internet, they have capacity for processing and so on. So these, these things could, could, be, could be overcome by using, I don't know, the MQTT protocol or something like that, that is also integrated in, in sensor thing, but I believe we need to work more on, 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 these, uh, on these aspects. Thank you, Joan. Final step, invitation to Italian audience. Uh, quindi una, un invito in particolare ai nostri ospiti italiani a condividere um, opinioni, commenti riguardo a questi aspetti. Beh, allora, eh, Stefano Livucci, Regione Emilia Romagna, provo a dire qualcosa io. Come dicevo prima, come ente regione, tipicamente un ente regione è un ente di programmazione, però come sta succedendo negli ultimi dieci anni, cominciamo anche a essere enti che producono dei dati territoriali e geografici o coordinano la produzione e la divulgazione dei dati. Quindi da questo punto di vista c'è un interesse molto forte a conoscere molto meglio gli standard, ad assumere competenze, come è scritto qui nella slide, Credo almeno in Regione Emilia Romagna ci siano meno, meno problemi di organizzazione, soprattutto nelle relazioni con altri soggetti come eh, le agenzie eh, ARPAE che ha eh, partecipato oggi, che producono eh, dati, eh, dati dinamici, eh, eh, rapporti, problemi di rapporti non ce ne sono, ma eh, dobbiamo essere molto più bravi a cercare di eh, utilizzare questi dati e veicolarli anche verso altri soggetti che magari ne hanno bisogno e stanno immaginando iniziative di utilizzo per magari fare analisi particolari o eh, creare dati a valore aggiunto. E, peraltro c'è un forte interesse come ente Regione Emilia Romagna anche il tema di innovazione nell'elaborazione nell dei dati, quindi anche del, dell'approccio big data, quindi eh, i dati e eh, i prodotti in tempo reale sono di estremo interesse. 
al momento dobbiamo far, assumere competenze, quindi è molto importante che sia annotato nella slide questo aspetto della, della conoscenza degli standard e, e delle competenze in merito perché per noi come ente è proprio un aspetto focale, mentre invece sugli altri temi eh, ci riconosciamo insomma, abbastanza pronti a lavorare anche in questo settore. Grazie, no, sono aspetti molto importanti sicuramente da considerare per, uh, per promuovere l'utilizzo di, di questi standard che sicuramente hanno dei vantaggi e, e dobbiamo appunto considerare tutti gli aspetti, non solo il lato tecnologico. Uh, qualcun altro vuole aggiungere qualcosa, commentare ulteriormente? Se posso, Antonio Rotundo. Certo. Allora in italiano non sì, magari è meglio. <ride> eh, no, riguardo alla disponibilità di dati, secondo me un impulso potrebbe essere da queste diciamo, nuove regole che stiamo definendo in Italia, ma che, che eh, sono poi stabilite a livello europeo con la direttiva Open Data, nel senso che come dicevo prima, eh, i dati dinamici, quindi dati anche eh, rilevati da, da sensori, sono una delle categorie di dati che eh, a livello europeo e eh, ovviamente a livello nazionale sono identificati come eh, dati ad elevato eh, potenziale socio-economico, quindi da rendere, eh, da rendere disponibili obbligatoriamente e quindi con queste regole ovviamente per le pubbliche amministrazioni, ma anche per gli altri soggetti che comunque gestiscono un servizio pubblico in Italia, eh, c'è l'obbligo di renderli disponibili e la direttiva aggiunge ovviamente disponibili eh, immediatamente dopo la raccolta, perché è chiaro che il potenziale anche eh, a livello informativo eh, è tale se il dato viene ris reso disponibile subito, cioè se viene reso disponibile eh, dopo tempo che è stato raccolto, chiaramente l'utilità di quel dato viene, viene a, a diminuire. E in più, quindi questo sulla disponibilità dei dati, io credo che ci, ci sarà anche un aumento di disponibilità dei dati, con credo una, una qualità maggiore, perché poi in queste linee guida che, ci, che, che citavo diamo comunque indicazioni anche sia sugli aspetti organizzativi che sulla qualità dei dati, in modo tale da rendere disponibili i dati di, di qualità ovviamente che possono essere riutilizzati, ma anche, eh, se non ricordo male, si citava anche in una slide stamattina per quanto riguarda il licensing framework, perché in molti casi i dati che, eh, possono, che vengono riusati non sono integrabili perché sono soggetti a licenze diverse che non sono in alcuni casi compatibili e quindi non possono essere integrati. Eh, con le linee guida si definisce un licensing from, framework abbastanza chiaro eh, che si, ri, si rifà poi alle indicazioni della Commissione europea, quindi CC BY eh, 4.0, quindi con la sola condizione dell'attribuzione senza altre eh, condizioni per riusare i dati o in alternativa eh, CC0, quindi il pubblico dominio per cui possono essere utilizzati senza nessuna eh, condizione. Per quanto riguarda la conoscenza degli standard, eh, degli standard come dicevo, praticamente eh, eh, noi nelle linee guida eh, abbiamo inserito per ciascuna sezione delle risorse utili che possono essere a cui bisogna fare riferimento per implementare poi le, le, le indicazioni che diamo nelle linee guida. Una di queste, queste risorse utili è proprio lo standard OGC Sensor Things uh, API e eh, poi nello specifico ovviamente la, la, la good practice definita nell'ambito di, di Spire. Quindi chi si trova a implementare le linee guida per quella tipologia di dati ovviamente eh, è... è è invitato e raccomand eh, la raccomandazione è di utilizzare ovviamente e fare riferimento a quella good practice e quindi utilizzare lo standard EG OGC, quindi probabilmente le linee guida possono essere anche queste uno strumento per far conoscere gli standard che sono disponibili per la, eh, i vari aspetti diciamo. Per finire, come Agenzia per l'Italia Digitale svolgiamo anche un ruolo di, di formazione su questi, questi aspetti, facciamo 
Eh, abbiamo organizzato sia lo scorso anno che in questo anno, che ha appena iniziato, diversi cicli di webinar su cui appunto approfondiamo tutti questi aspetti. Come dicevamo, insomma, anche nei, nei contatti che abbiamo avuto nelle scorse settimane, potrebbe essere anche questo dell'OGC Sensor Things API eh, uno degli, dei temi da trattare nei prossimi webinar eh, per le pubbliche amministrazioni italiane e per gli altri soggetti interessati, considerando che in genere abbiamo numeri elevati di partecipanti, iscrizioni a intorno a 700-800 iscrizioni, poi ovviamente gli, i partecipanti effettivi sono intorno a 500, quindi può essere una buona platea per fare divulgazione e formazione anche sugli standard. Grazie. Benissimo, grazie per questa, questa visione e anche prospettiva verso un po' gli sviluppi futuri. Passiamo ancora all'ultima slide di Mentimeter. Not switching. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Next slide. Okay, here is about ranking. So, uh, what are the what is the help that uh, is uh, needed? Uh, It will be probably in line with what you already discussed, but uh, also what is the most important one? We took these, um, these entries from the, uh, from the questionnaire that we have shared with you before this workshop. Uh, so, yes, the, the questionnaire is still there, so if you would like to add anything there, uh, you are welcome to do it and uh, we'll use it in, uh, uh, we'll use the, the results and answer in our uh, following um, yeah, reports uh, and, uh, and reasoning about action plans. Nice, there is rather clear ranking. I'm not sure if you are able to, to see the results clearly. I can try to do that, more or less. So first, digital skills, that's, that's clear, okay, so we have to work towards it. No, it has changing, it is changing. So clear policy directives is also uh, at the first uh, slash second place, so now we uh, got to the first. Chiare indicazioni nei documenti di policies, so we, we really need to Um, yeah, to work together with decision makers and, uh, um, and administration uh, uh, entities in order to influence uh, or uh, yeah influence the policies or at least to uh, to have a clear exchange and to be aware of the potential of the standards and uh, uh, of the advantages that can be brought to the policies. And uh, this should be clear. Digital skills, yes, okay, definitely, it's it's jumping uh, uh, again up. A third place we have human resources. 
So yeah, oh, okay. So it is something. Uh, um, I, I think this list is also interesting for the entities um, that are in the public administrations and public uh, institutions. Uh, that's also where uh, to invest and where to um, to direct the efforts of the next uh, uh, of the next times, probably. So more human resources or different uh, uh, additional human resources, um, digital skills, um, policies, already considering the technology which is there. Technical rules, standard implementation tools. Okay, today we, we saw a, a range of them um, and uh, they are still under development, so more will come, but of course, that's a, that's a critical point. Understanding interoperability services features and use, which goes uh, also as part of digital skills, software and technologies, a strategy. Okay, a strategy, it's, uh, it's something needed. And uh, understanding the potential and applications, uh, um, not limited to one kind of data, it's uh, Rather the end, so I assume that we have clear uh, understanding of potential and applications of, uh, of this, uh, which is presented today. Uh, anyone want to comment on this? Uh, any, any comment, any, any question also to the speakers of today from the, the ones remaining in the, uh, in the meeting? Um, in Italian is okay. I'm also addressing the same question to the audience here. So if yeah, you have absolutely. any questions and, uh, and comments, okay, please, Pierre George, come. Uh, very shortly, please I think, uh, in my personal opinion, the first uh, uh, support needed uh, in terms of um, clear policy uh, directives, indications, I think that what uh, Antonio presented, even though not yet uh, available because under development, but the section on the guidelines with reference to material and to us uh, very clear indications already provided by Agid can fill in this gap. So I'm quite uh, optimistic. Of course, today this is happening because uh, all this material is not fully available and when will be available, it's not probably so easy to digest, but I think it's, uh, it's a good uh, uh, support. In terms of digital skills, of course, the, the path to, to fill in the knowledge and skill gap is a bit more uh, uh, long to cover. Just uh, this consideration to share. Thank you, Giacomo. Um, any other comment? Commenti anche da, dagli ospiti italiani? oltre a quelli uh, condivisi nella slide precedente. So, uh, it seems that, okay, no one else has uh, anything to, to share more. We, we have a clear result from the meeting of today, I think. We are all hungry as well, so I would conclude the workshop here and thank you very much to all of you for uh, your uh, presentations and participations and uh, input to the, to the meeting and uh, yeah, have a nice day and thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you to you. Bye. Bye. Thank you everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much.